Hi and welcome. Thank you all for joining us. I'm super excited to chat again with Nate Palmer from Low Carb Hustle. Hi, Nate, and welcome. What's going on? I'm so pumped to be here. Thanks for having me on the show. We had so much fun last time. We did. I think we dropped a few too many truth bombs. I got rid of a few followers. That was good. Very important. Oh, oh good, good. Do you really get rid of, like, do, do people really unfollow you? I hope so. I don't know. I, <laughs> I I can't be bothered to check that because number one, I don't know how. And number two, that would most likely impact my very fragile self-esteem. So I don't do it. <laughs> yeah. People do unfollow me every once in a while. So if I have like an outburst on something that happened and I speak up, um, but I uh, like, I like to speak out, you know, I how feel many outbursts like, do you think we'll have today? Well, I'm counting on a few, at least two, I think minimum. <laughs> All right. So Nate, can you share a little bit about your background with our audience? And also, I want to also get the little uh, behind the scenes story of how you became the host of Low Carb Hustle. But let's start way back with your diet and like the whole thing. So I have been into like exercise training and nutrition for a really long time. I'm 35 and um, I kind of got started on this when I was 11. And the reason for it wasn't because I was good at sports, but it was because someone broke into my house. And so I was by myself alone. I grabbed a steak knife and I hid under my bed. And I was a generally just like a frail, scared person when I was 11, as most of us are. And I remember being like, I guess I'm just going to die now. I did, I did not die, by the way. I was just like, just on a, you know, don't, I know I was ruining the story, but I didn't die. Thankfully. Uh, <laughs> but I really like that moment. I don't know if I could have articulated it, but I thought I don't ever want to feel powerless like this again. Mm. And if I have a big enough muscles, I have a big enough beard and more neck tattoos, no one's really going to ever mess with me anymore because I'm so strong and awesome. Where's and so the neck kind of, tattoos? Uh, I, I, it's, it's a work in progress. I got some, I got some, uh, a little ones creeping up, but, I see. Uh, <laughs> but I've been itching for one. Like I I'm, I'm like, I'm getting my arms lasered so I can get tattoos and not have like, like hair on them. But Right. I'm not getting my neck laser. So I was like, I'll just go get a neck tattoo. And I was like, should I think about what I want to go, what I want to get first? Or should I just go get one? And I think I'm just going to get one. Well, Doesn't you can like always laser it out and change <laughs> it. You know, I feel by the time you go through the whole process and then you change your mind, they probably have really great technology at hand to like remove it and change it. So I would have get a steak tattooed right here. Oh, I love that. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Then everyone call me T-Bone. And I, I feel like that's a cool nickname. <laughs> Any meat-themed nickname, honestly, I'm into it. So if you have one you for me by the end of this call. Drop them. Like, yeah. And everybody watching, drop them in the comments below. <laughs> yeah, I need it. I need that for, again, my very, very frail self-esteem. So right. kind of got into fitness there. Wanted to, wanted to become like, you know, bigger and stronger, et cetera. Did everything wrong for, you know, 10 years or so. Um, finally was like, was graduating from college, getting my degree in business. And I shirked hundred percent of my studies and instead was just consuming information about fitness and new training and nutrition principles. So reading all of the archives of like T nation and ask men and breaking muscle and all these websites and being like, this is what I want to do. So I graduated in 2008, um, became a personal trainer, um, started a big gym there, loved that, then ended up opening my own studio, working a lot with golfers, working a lot on the flexibility and core aspects. I feel like every little thing I've done has really informed my next piece. Mm. My wife and I moved to Seattle and I worked at an amazing gym out there called Pro Sports Club, which is do which is I think can still are running the largest weight loss study in the entire United States. Really? So okay. it's called the 2020 Lifestyles Program. And okay. it basically every week you'd have three appointments with a trainer one appointment with a nutritionist, one appointment with a, like a mental health counselor. Every month you would do an appointment with a doctor, you had a support group. And then there was something, some other thing. Yeah. So like you're getting your blood drawn. You're like, it was very, very highly regulated every single week. All the doctors would sit down and look at like the client notes that I was making um, and going through this process. So I feel like, like at that point, I started to really understand like, what is like, what is going on with our like the food complex and why are people having such a hard time dropping weight and losing fat? And it really, for, at that point, we were talking so much about like hypertension and diabetes and some of these, these like cardiovascular diseases and metabolic syndromes that were just plaguing people. And I started to start understanding 
that it wasn't about like this willpower and you're just being too much of a pussy. It was like, listen, someone is sitting in a room right now engineering a food that is hyper palatable, that has just the right amount of sugar, fat, and salt that is going to stimulate the dopamine receptors in your brain to cause you to want to eat more of it. And by the way, they're making it now so soft that you can eat it in three bites so it doesn't hit your satiety mechanism until you're until you're like four McDoubles deep, you know? Yeah. And so we have all this, We have all, the deck is stacked against us. And it's stacked against especially people who don't understand these things. And so I've kind of made it my mission with, the podcast, I've written a couple of books, articles and stuff like that to help illuminate this, but also in a fun way because it's just fucking fitness, you know, and I think people get real butthurt and hung up on specific dogmatic stuff. So I try to keep it at least interesting and fun. I love it. Um, before I ask you further about your current um, exercise and the nutrition and how you eventually came to realize that keto is, you know, better and carnivore and all that kind of stuff. Just want everybody to know that we all agree that pussies are strong. They can take a beating. Now that we've established that, that was just an expression that we say. <laughs> That's fair. Yeah. Okay. I... <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> 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 the study that you were working on, did they did they just go with like the traditional food diet pyramid? No, they they did a pretty strict elimination diet. So they oh. pull out a lot of different stuff. And I think for the, like, for the first phase, they keep in just vegetables and proteins. So like just meats, eggs, no dairy or anything like that. I and am then surprised. Would... Yeah. But uh, like, I think that like that was based off of a lot of, you know, the, like the research and it wasn't, it was, this is all private research. This gym was basically funded by Microsoft, you know, like, so Microsoft kind of came up and this gym was in Bellevue at the same time. So they grew up together. So Got there's it. a, there's a lot of money floating around to do research and studies and things like that. Like this gym was crazy. It was like 400 plus thousand square feet. They had seven or eight different pools. They had like six basketball courts. They had a medical spa. So you could get like Botox and stuff done. They had an actual doctor. They had a physical therapy clinic. They had wow. an auto spa. This place is nuts. Wow. So it was really cool. It was a really fun environment to be a part of. And, and they had 147 trainers on staff while I was there. For how like, long? Wow. That's I, huge. I'm surprised huge. I've never we were, heard of them. And we were all packed. All of us, our schedule is completely full. What, what is the name of the gym? Pro Sports Club. Pro Sports Club. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm shocked that I haven't heard of it before, given how huge it is. Um, How many years did you work there? I was there for about four years. We were in Seattle four years. Then, uh, like I said, we moved to South America for a year to try right. stuff out. Right. Okay. Got it. All right. So... How did your evolution happen with regards to realizing all the lies with nutrition? I think that that like being in that environment where I was kind of exposed to some of the truth about like diabetes is not just this genetic thing. And oh, no, you have no control over it. It's it's a function of the foods we're eating, the low quality stuff, like consistently spiking the blood sugar. And I think I was really enamored by learning about specifically diabetes because i think blood sugar has so much to do with satiety our energy and i think that if we can listen to the signals our body is telling us we can start to eat more intuitively rather than having to always track every single macro we, we're eating which for most of us is not realistic so yeah. it's like i was really into training initially i was like how do i get bigger how do i get stronger how do i get more flexible how do i help people with their golf game and then working at pro sports club really changed my paradigm to be like like if we don't lock down the nutrition piece, I'm having people spinning their wheels. Like if I'm being really honest, Sarah, I, like when I was working as a trainer in my first two places, I'm probably getting 18, 20% results. Like, you know, one wow. in five people is making, is, is getting the results they're looking for. Yeah. And since then we've probably been on more of like the 55, 65% train, just because when I bring people in now to, to work with me. We should work so much on nutrition and exercises this tiny little thing. It's like a placeholder that we eventually add more to. But until you get the nutrition dialed in, you decrease your inflammation. You make sure that you have lifestyles and habits and places and piece, pieces in place that you can go grab good food on the road or you figure out like what you're having for lunches on most of your days. Like the exercise doesn't even really matter because you're going to undo all of that work or you're too inflamed to even benefit from. It. It's shocking how quickly you can undo the work. Um, by eating the wrong foods. It's, it's literally shocking. I, you know, I show this uh, slide to my students every semester. Um, I teach at Miami-Dade College. 
And so I uh, have the slide that shows you every tiny little ridiculously small amount of food, let's say a tablespoon of oil has 135 calories. You would have to literally walk for an hour to just burn that one tablespoon. A slice of pizza has 350 calories, medium. Now we're not talking large size. We're not talking cheese, uh, you know, the stuffed crust. 350 calories in a slice of pizza, you would have to swim intensely for a whole hour to burn that off i mean it's it's quite shocking the amount of physical activity so you can never outrun a bad diet this is why it is so important what we're doing and raising awareness and i can vouch for what you're saying because when i was seeing clients um back when i was still working with uh what i was taught in school and doing you know the <laughs> six uh, ounces six. of grains or whatever yeah yeah six meals a day got to stoke the metabolic furnace yes yeah, as, oh, as you know that is but don't don't get me started on that. Oh, I'd love to get you started. <laughs> oh, you want <laughs> don't don't. We want your expertise today. <laughs> so I wouldn't get as much results. I and I would tell I I would agree with you. Like yeah, twenty percent, and those are just people that no matter what you give them, they're gonna follow it, and they're you know and genetically they're they're definitely uh, better able to tolerate the carbohydrates. Um, but I mean the success rate for me with my clients now compared to before it's mind blowing it's like the only reason somebody would not get the results if they're working with me right now is that it is that fitness is so low on their priority list that yeah it's nice but it's they're not really prioritizing their health there is zero excuse for anybody who's working with me to not get guaranteed results you know because it's just so much easier when your physiology is regulated so yeah i'm i'm glad that you've had the same exact experience yeah. And I mean, when you're following a proven, a proven system too. Yeah. I think a lot of times people like, if I can rant for a second, like, I think a lot of times trainers, especially like online coaches are always like, oh, it's a cust a hundred percent customized. Or if you're from the UK, you go, it's a bespoke program. And I think people get too tied up in like the custom, give me something proven, you know, and let's adapt it slightly. Mm -hmm. I don't need, people don't need to reinvent the wheel. And I think people are doing a disservice because like, if you're shipping off a workout to someone and you're like, never tried this one before, let's see how it goes. Like, how do you know what that pacing is like? How do you know what's like what's going on with your client? Like, give them something proven, make those small adjustments and just get, like people want a system that works. Yeah. They don't necessarily need these like custom plans and PDFs that you're mocking up on your computer. Yeah, yeah. The, so yeah, I, for me, I think that the diet, giving them the diet, I, I obviously you ha I have to go through the calculations and do all that stuff. And I get like their data, their stuff, their how many steps they're getting, how much they're burning calories, all that kind of stuff. But I would say the vast majority of the work that I do is really mindset, you know, because mm -hmm. I mean, everybody knows meat is good. At, at least my clients know because they find me from my YouTube channel. So they're, they're already, they know that I'm probably going to push them <laughs> towards more meat you know, more animal based. So that's the easy part. It's the mindset and it's the psychology and that part of it that is that I would say is custom if you want, but uh, so, yeah, because everyone's yeah. coming from a different, different aspect mentally. Oh, there's but so much. You're using like, yeah. the same framework. You're using a framework that is like meat first, you know, like, and like kind of following a carnivore framework because it's proven because it works. You know, it's yeah. not like, oh, so-and-so loves corn. So let's include corn in her diet. No, follow the, follow the frame, the framework. Yeah. People all the time are asking me like, Hey, I was doing oatmeal for breakfast for a while. Can I keep doing that? I was like, oh, was that working for you? Then why are you here? Yeah. Like, don't like, we're doing something different because what you were doing before is not working. Yeah. Let me show you how you, how it fits in with the system. Yeah. You run the system and we'll see how you feel in a, in a yeah. week or two. I get it though. I get why some, I get those two, you know, like um, clients who are eating something on a regular basis and they want to try and keep it as much as possible. And what I found works is not to tell them we're going to cut it out from day one. Mm. What I found works is that I can minimize the amount of that food. Let's say if it's sometimes it's like a beverage, you know, like a boba or something like that that they, they just have it every single day and they're really trying to protect it and so what i'll do like i'll cut it in half or if it's the caffeine and i know they're struggling with headaches and it's causing them to have binges so i want to eliminate the root cause of those binges which is the headache and so i have to cut out the caffeine so i'll go gradually with them but you'd be shocked at how quickly once you build that momentum in a few days the momentum builds up 
it's shocking how much more receptive and motivated they become. And they're like, okay, now I'm ready. And then we cut everything out. Um, so I have found that sometimes not being too rigid can, can go a long way. And you'd be shocked at how quickly they'd be open then to doing what you want them to do, you know? Yeah. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm the same way. I have a, like a framework that I have people follow. So if it's like something that fits a framework and they're like, I'm having carbs here. I'm like, yeah. well, let's put your carbs to where they exist in the framework. If you want an oatmeal, you can have oatmeal with your dinner as, as it, you see it here. And then like, but like you're saying, like once they start seeing the difference, they're like, oh, I guess I didn't really need that. You exactly. Know? And you know, success is motivating. Yeah, exactly. You have to, they have to have some form of success, some form of momentum building up as the momentum builds up the motivation that you get then gives you like the discipline you don't or you don't feel like you need as much discipline because you're already motivated you already have that momentum going for yeah. you and then yeah and then i another thing is tracking man i have them track everything way you have them like way measure everything track track I all the calories it, yeah yeah i do that because um a lot of the clients that well not everybody sometimes if i have a client who has a lot of weight to lose the, just changing the quality of their food can have them drop significant amounts of weight but as we get closer and closer to those last 5 10 15 pounds we start to i really have to have a handle on everything i need to know exactly what's going on because everybody seems to wildly underestimate the amount of calories <laughs> found in foods you can't have you know five ribeyes a day i mean a ribeye is like this size and it's like 900 calories you know so I don't want them to eat all the fat from their diet because I want to give the stimulus to the body to burn the fat that's on their frame. Um, we still have fat, a lot of fat in their diet, but it's not something crazy, you know, to the point where they're just, you know, it's, there's not enough volume if they want to be able to lose weight, you know, then, then they have to eat more. So it's, it, it really is dependent on what, clients I have and what their goals are, how much weight really they have to lose. Different stages, I give them different approaches. But as we, a lot of my clients, especially recently, this past month, I have a lot of clients that are so close to like the optimal, like getting abs and everything. And so with those clients, we're, we're going psycho every, every decimal <laughs> we're tracking. That's what it takes. People don't realize how much work it gets to, to remove that last few pounds to, to reveal um, you know, the shape. So, so yeah, it depends, I guess the answer is. <laughs> I, I feel like I can get people to like, or men, especially like within like to about 12% body fat without having to track anything. Yeah. I think if you want, like, and I think that's for a lot of the clients that I work with, they're like, that's good. You see the outline of the abs they're They feel great there. They feel good in a t-shirt. They feel good out like with their shirt off. And if you do want to drop down to that, like that seven, eight percent body fat, where you're seeing all your abs, yeah, you gotta get, you gotta get you gotta in there get and track because little tablespoons of peanut butter is not what you think it is. Oh no, and it's so easy to overeat. Do do you do you see more men or women in your like as client work? I'm probably 75, 25 men, women. Okay. Um, For a long and, time, I was marketing pretty hard to men. Yeah. So yeah, and I feel also just generally men gravitate towards men and women generally gravitate because they feel like we have some more similar experiences maybe yeah um, not I mean, always I get that it's yeah like, yeah i mean we've both been in the field for a long time so it's obviously like we obviously can help both people but when you have like yeah. shared experiences and you can tell that story and talk about being a dad in my case you know like people will be like put themselves in your shoes right so whatever yeah. whatever story you're telling people like put themselves into that first person yeah, exactly. Do you, so do you find um do you find it easier or harder to get results um with males versus females? Um it's it's I think it's different because men seem to get results faster, but they also seem to adopt exactly what I'm saying slower. Women wow. seem to be more compliant up front. And they'll say, and they, cause I feel like most women fall into the obliger category. If you're talking about like the four, the four tendencies, yeah, they want to, they want their people pleasers. They want to do what they're told. Okay. So I think in that case, if like, if it's like, Hey, I'm, I'm saying do this, they go, okay, I'm gonna do all these things where I get a lot of pushback. Like, so why do I have to do this? And I was already doing this. And what can I do bench press again? And I'm like, can you just do the things? And then we'll, we'll discuss that in a month. Like, but 
once they again once like you said once you get that was like results you get a little more buy-in especially from my guys um, where i feel like women are up front are just a little bit more like whatever you say let's go i'll do it yeah I love it. I, I, I love that you mentioned that. That is so true in, in our in our personalities because women are raised to be people pleasers. And, um, you know, for me, probably even more because I was raised in Lebanon. So it's like times a thousand, you know, and uh, it's taken a lot of work to try and put, you know, boundaries and pay attention to how I act and react. And, but even now, I feel like um, like when I'm communicating with people, I always want to smooth out conversations. I always want to make mm. sure that it's comfortable. Um, and uh, and sometimes I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Like it's fine to smile and be friendly. I feel like some some guys could help yep. themselves if they were a little bit more, <laughs> you know. I hear, I hear 100% what you're saying. Because right? I'm, a, I'm a huge people pleaser too. And I've kind of been to that same journey of trying to set up boundaries. But I've also realized that being a people pleaser makes me a great coaching client. Like when I get coaches, I am like, I'm on it. So I feel like I can use that in like in a way that benefits me and is mm. an asset to me rather than what I feel like I've used it in the past where I feel like a doormat, you know, and saying yes to everything. I love it. Good point. All right. So you weren't always keto at all. You criticize keto. <laughs> so tell us the whole, everything, how it went down. Tell us everything. So, <laughs> so like when I was working as a personal trainer or, you know, kind of starting off as an online coach, the story I heard over and over again from people was I did keto. I lost 20 pounds and then I gained 20 pounds right back. And so I kept hearing that over and over and over again. And so I would tell people, listen, it's not sustainable. It's not something that you're going to do. Like stop trying to do this and like use this as a cheat code to the system. Just do it in a more sustainable fashion. And so I really would try to talk people down. And honestly, I still do. I want to make sure that people's expectations are in the right spot. And they don't think that doing keto is this Amazon prime results and everything else is no, uh, is no bueno mm. because I want people's expectations to be in the right spot. And I want them to understand what the cost is that like of keto is because it's not just, it's not just, you know, going to the store and buying more meat. Like a lot of people think it is. So um, I started, I, I was running a podcast called the million dollar body. I wrote a book about that. I still inc I incorporate carbs into my, into a lot of my programs called through carb backloading is one of my favorite mechanisms. Mm. Um, and in March of this year, I took over the podcast called the low carb hustle. So from Robert Sykes, the keto savage, Danny Vega, who is like a hardcore carnival. He, he did, ruminant only June. It's crazy. And Adam Shibley. So I took over the show and I had Robert on and I was talking to him about keto. And I was like, listen, man, like one of the big criticisms I've always had about keto is that it's not sustainable. And he was like, well, I think there's the, it is for the right person. And he went on to explain that the person, the, the ketogenic diet is correct for is someone who loves binary options. So the person who can't really tolerate the, yeah, you can have a little bit of this, but not too much. You know, the person who's like, I can have zero drinks or I can have 15 drinks. And those are my only two options. So he's like someone who loves a binary yes or no on or off like that. They do well with that. And then someone who also wants to not just be healthy, mm. but actually thrive. They want to improve their mental performance. They like the, they care deeply about those things and they will take the time to dial those in. And I feel like for a lot of people, they just want to drop some weight and look better in a dress. And it doesn't really matter about their mental performance or their, or their focus and energy throughout the day. And I, for those people, I don't necessarily push them towards a ketogenic lifestyle. Mm. So he said, he challenged me at the end of the podcast. He said, Hey, listen, you've had a lot of critiques about it, but you've never actually done it. Go do it for 30 days. See how you feel. So I went and got my blood work done. I did my like fasting glucose. I did all these metrics. I measured my sleep. I'm using an aura ring. And for 30 days, I went very, very strict keto with under 30 grams of total carbs. Total, not net. Yeah. Robert oh. Sykes said, Keto Savage said, net carbs give you net results. Total carbs give you total results. So I was like, all right, I bro. Agree. Yeah. I, I've stopped doing that too with my clients too. I, I just, I no longer, I don't care about your net carbs. Give me the total carbs. This whole idea that, no, no, no. Some fiber gives you calories. Some all kinds of stuff happen. They, they do still release an insulin spike. So, but yeah. Yeah. And I think that like, if you're, if you kind of like, if you can play the net carbs game, you can make a ketogenic diet, a hundred percent processed foods. You know, you go to Costco, like go to Costco and you're looking at anything like keto snacks 
and it's like 30 grams of carbs and they're like only three net carbs and you're like what how did you do what kind of math are you guys doing there you know so between like the the dietary fiber and these like the sugar alcohols yeah. and stuff somehow you can just make up numbers and i think that like again that's the mindset that keeps people trapped right they're yeah. like i'm doing keto and you're like you just ate a cinnamon roll and they're like it's a keto cinnamon roll <laughs> like you're gonna shake them you know like, I, was, I was that person that's hilarious yeah but but like it's the it's it's trying to cheat it you're right yeah. you're not you're not trying to do the work you're trying to cheat to get the results yeah. and like yes can you have a keto cinnamon roll every so often yeah can you have it for breakfast every day hell no, no. what are you doing no. Literally yeah. track your weight every day. You will be shocked how quickly you will drop the weight and the inflammation and the body fat just by cutting out those keto foods and, and just relying on that nut carbs. It doesn't work. Yeah. This uh, total, like this net carbs. I just think that's just, that's horseshit. I'm not, I'm not here for it because I want people to like, I want people to, who are looking to pursue something better. And, you know, like a, like a treat here and there. Great. But also like, you know, if you're going to do like these like sugar-free keto treats, like that's like having sex with your clothes on. Just like go <laughs> have a brownie, enjoy it yes. and get back to your life, you know? Mm -hmm. So I did the, did the experiment, did 30 days, me and uh, Kyle, my buddy Kyle, who uh, who's the, kind of the co-host with me on the show and measured all these metrics and everything improved over time. So it looks like my, like my body fat dropped. Um, I maintained my muscle mass, um, like my blood glucose dropped, my A1C dropped. Like it just, mm -hmm. it just, everything seemed to like, just get a little bit better. My LDL cholesterol did go up, but I'm also not worried about cholesterol. I don't, yeah. I don't really care. And I think that that's largely overblown about cholesterol being this negative thing when it's really just a transportation device for fatty acids. It's all like, BS. I'd right. be more worried if your LDL was on the lower end, because we know the lower your LDL, the higher your chances of all cause mortality, the higher the risk of Alzheimer's, dementia, all kinds of stuff happen when your body struggles to deliver enough cholesterol to make optimal levels of hormones. So like I was on the, I was on kind of like the lower end of the, the healthy range or whatever. And yeah. I, I kind of went just a little bit outside of it. And I, again, not worried about it. I felt really good. I was sleeping well. And so, and everyone was like, well, did you get the keto flu? I was like, nah, because I know how, how electrolytes work. So I was, I was taking element the entire time that I was electrolyte packets and stuff. And I just, I really enjoyed it. Um, my only critique of it really was, I feel like it's a very privileged diet because it's more expensive to eat that way. And I think that it takes more time if you're cooking that much food mm. and I was going, I was going really whole foods with it. So I wasn't doing a lot of processed foods. I was doing like probably between a pound and two pounds of red meat every single day. I was eating probably like 70 to 90 eggs by myself every week, mm. you know? So, and I made like a bulk order of like grass fed steaks and stuff like that. So it was, it was more expensive than I, what I normally spend on food. And it's easy to see once you do a diet like that, you're like, oh, it's e like, that's why everyone's using bread and rice and grains and beans to cut, to cut their meat with yeah. so that the foods go a little bit longer. So oh, I, yeah. so I can see both sides. Um, and, but I just had a client came to me and he was like, man, I got, I need to, I need to lose weight. First of all, secondly, I just had got diagnosed with cancer. So you got diagnosed with testicular cancer. I did a, the podcast episode is up. I think it's number 79. Talk about this. Okay. Low carb hustle number mm -hmm. 79. Okay. I think so. Yeah. Um, but he was like, what, what should I do? Like, I need, I need to go back in for a biopsy in six weeks. It was, I'll find it later. Anyways. The, he, so we put him on a keto diet. Well, if you, if, if you just uh, tell me their, his name or the uh, 73, 073, okay. which diet will help me fight cancer. Okay. So number, episode number 73 on low carb hustle. Okay. Yeah. So we put him on a ketogenic diet. And so like, we just kind of talked about, talked this through, but, and I wanted to go back and do another episode with him because he had his biopsy two weeks ago and he came back and they said, they said it was going to spread to the lymph nodes from the, the testes and they couldn't find it anywhere. Completely cancer-free. Wow. And so he's competing in a jujitsu tournament next in two weeks in Vegas. And like, I don't know, it's just so exciting because like, I think there's like the applications for something like this, where really we're, we're utilizing nutrition as the primary defense and like using that as medicine it's just so exciting you know you know who so would I, be proud you know professor thomas seafried 
He would be so proud of what you just did. <laughs> <laughs> well, you should send him an email. Let him know. I will. I will. <laughs> so the only intervention you did was putting him on keto? Wow. And okay, so how long did it take from his diagnosis to the second checkup where it showed that there was no longer any cancer? Uh, his diagnosis, I think, was like four or five weeks before before yeah. we before we talked. Uh, I think his second his biopsy was six weeks after that. So so basically, I'm assuming after he talked with you, you put him on keto, and so it took six weeks of him being on keto to get another checkup done. So six weeks cleared the cancer. That's incredible. You know, know. this is crazy stuff. And I mean, like, I know there's like, there's medical miracles and things are going on. And I'm sure like, I'm not even aware of like the full spectrum of what, what, like, what was happening. I'm just, you know, I'm just helping him with his nutrition, his fitness, but to see that kind of results, like, it's just so exciting. And it makes me so sad when I see people who are dealing with like, like hypertension and diabetes. Cause I'm like, these are completely reversible <laughs> things. Guys like, stuff. yeah. Yeah. Like, wh like, why are you having that Coke? Why are you eating the chips at this restaurant? Like, you know, you're sick, you know, you're on insulin. You know that this is impacting your life. This is going to make you a worse spouse, parent, you know, grandparent. It's going to shut your, like, cut your, your, like, your length of your life shorter. You're going to have less energy. Like, why are you doing this to yourself when you know there's an option? Because when they get diagnosed, they go to a dietitian, and the dietitian is following what the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics is recommending, which is the seven to 11 servings of grain for someone following a 2000 calorie uh, diet. So they start them off with all the carbs, whole grains, because you need the fiber. And then they started pumping them with the drugs um, to, so that their bodies can handle the carbs that the dietitians are giving them. And that is like what? 95%, if not more, of dietitians. <laughs> That's how they're operating. And we're talking a developed country like the United States. Like when I was growing up in Lebanon doing my bachelor's and everything, we take everything from the United States. We look at the academy as like our guiding light, you know? And whatever they say, the, the vast majority of the world is living in developing conditions. And so they don't have the resources to have their own institutions and put out their own research so they just look at the academy of nutrition and dietetics and they follow their lead completely oblivious to what the food corporations have done to the integrity of of, of the science and you know our profession a lot at least some of these developing countries that where their corruption is rampant mm -hmm. at least they have the just like the the kindness to have it more on the surface we're like yeah it's corruption Whereas here in the United States, we're like, it's not corrupt. By the way, the like the the FDA, who is supposed to be lobbying for our health and safety, is also re is responsible for the financial success of pharmaceutical companies and grains and farms and and uh, like and like the Kellogg Corporation. Mm -hmm. How does that make sense? That's yeah. just deeper, deep, deeply rooted corruption, right? Yeah. It doesn't. It's a conflict of interest at its at its core. That and that's so been going true. on since 1900s, right? True. That's true. They're, they're being funded, literally being funded by the pharmaceutical companies. I mean, you can literally just go FDA budget or FDA funding, and they'll put for every year, they'll tell you what percent comes from where. And it's, what is it like? I just checked it not that long ago. Um, it was like 60 or 40, no, maybe 40% uh, comes from the pharmaceutical companies. And the idea behind it is that the FDA was taking such a long time to approve drugs. So the pharmaceutical companies were like, we have these drugs and we want you to, we want to get approval to get them on the market. And so why don't you let us help you? Um, because you seem to be under um, underfunded. So let's let us give you the money so that you can hire more people so that you can speed up the process of approval. And that's how this unholy matrimony <laughs> started. Just uh, just so just so generous of them. What what good people. Like uh, I, right, I like that's just a, that's a good story. That is, yeah. Like, and, you know, what and could like, go wrong? And, I, and I'm sure there is an element of that in this, right? I'm sure that some of that money has gone towards bringing forth better medicines that that the, that people can use that are life saving. I'm yeah. sure there is an element of that. Yeah. But you take this to its natural conclusion, and now the people who are supposed to protect us are in bed with the people who are benefiting from our illnesses.
Yeah, their jobs literally depend on those funders, which are the pharmaceutical companies. And so it's like, you don't want to lose your jobs. So you're going to be very friendly in your process to approve those drugs, you know? So. And with, and if healthy people aren't paying clients, <laughs> then what is the incentive to make, you know, the 30% of people in the United States who are obese or overweight healthy again? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think what we're doing is the best thing we could do, raising awareness, you know, so that people put the pressure on their elected officials, put the pressure on those companies. And when the demand for real food and a completely different food environment starts to happen, the supply is going to follow, but it has to start with us, you know, and um, it's going to take a while, you know, but it's happening already. I mean, the American Heart Association has already been shamed um, into admitting and putting out a paper that a keto diet can also be used in type 2 diabetics in order to lower uh, their risk, you know, for heart disease. So, but I mean, how long Amazing. has it taken, you know? And, and the only reason this has happened is because everybody literally has shamed them into doing that. Every, I mean, it's a laughing stock. You go to any American Heart Association video, just read the comments. I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy. Well, it just like, it just so boggles the mind that like, you know, in the in the 70s, we went on this whole like rampant saturated fat as the enemy. And that came out with like, then we started doing all these like seed oils, canola oils, margarines, all these, these like products are supposedly heart healthy, right? Fed those to people for so long. And then we had the audacity to blame red meat I for right. all these new diseases that were emerging. We blame this ancient food that people have been eating for thousands of years. And we're like, you know, what's causing this new disease? Old food. Old food. And they're like, what about this new food we got? And they're like, that's not it. Couldn't be it. That's heart healthy. Didn't you read the study? You know, like. Yeah. It boggles the mind, but yeah. what, when, like, when you think about it, like, and I don't, I don't know where you stand on the vaccine thing. Right. But like, if you look at like, if at I'm the vaccine healthy, conversation, I'm not putting that stuff in my body. Totally fair. I don't and care. I definitely am not going to get it just so that I can get on a cruise or something. So I haven't been on a cruise, but, but hear me out on this one. Okay. So like right. over the past 10 years, we've heard a lot of people talk about, like there's been a lot of anti-vax stuff yeah. we've heard, right? So whether whatever side of the, you're like pro-vaccines or anti-vaccines, you've heard the rhetoric, right? Yeah. In the seventies and the eighties, we heard the rhetoric, saturated fats, saturated fats. It is impossible to separate yourself from the propaganda and the rhetoric that you've heard over and over and over again. Even if you were a staunch believer in one side or the other, you've been affected by that, you know? So when, when the public, like the public discourse as everything is about saturated fat is bad. Red meat is bad for your heart, you know, and then we're shouting from the rooftops. It's not, how could it be? Look at the data. People are like, no, I heard it's bad for you. It's common knowledge now. Right. And it's so, so hard to break that paradigm shift yeah. because of how much we've heard of it, regardless of where we stood beforehand. Does that make sense? Yeah. Repetition. I think it's like in marketing, Propaganda. they call it the exposure effect. I don't care how much you hate at first an ad for something. The first time you see it, they bombard you long enough with it that eventually it grows on you. And it's, it's a real psychological phenomenon. Yeah. Yeah. And just so, like, so suddenly you're listening to like a, you're humming along with like a, a ED medication ad <laughs> that's playing like your favorite Goo Goo Dolls song. You're like, that's I love so this true. ad. It's hilarious to go back to the shots. I don't think, I think we've been saying the words and they haven't been censoring us lately, oh, but um, I'm still kind of traumatized by it. Are, are, have you been censored by that? No, I don't talk about it. I, I try to, I do not speak about politics because A, now I don't really feel like that's my purview Yeah. and B, I don't want to, I want to continue to have my platform. Yeah, that's very smart. And I don't like willfully go there but i'm still angry at the fact that i did get censored and and what i mean by that is that i got a warning on my channel because of, i put out one video on um diet Actual immunity right the immunity right it was called the coronavirus diet right and the whole purpose of it was just how to improve your you know immune system and um they took it down literally the next day and i woke up to seeing I have a warning on on your YouTube channel, and so it hurts me to so get um, monetized for that, a while. Huh? 
So you can't no, monetize No, thankfully, them? it wasn't a strike. So a warning okay. is before a strike. So gotcha. had I continued to post videos like that, then I would have gotten a strike and then another one. And then by the third one, I think you if you get three strikes in a 90-day window, then they will um, completely like shut you down. And not only that, you won't even be able to create a new YouTube channel. <laughs> Sheesh. Yeah, it's pretty serious stuff. So you can imagine how how angry I was at that. So... Yeah, no, the, the only, the, for the whole, the whole discussion surrounding that was so crazy to me that, that nobody addressed immunity, nobody addressed health, no, uh, obesity was, and actually to this day is considered taboo. This is why you, you know, CNN, MSNBC, all of those channels, when have they ever really uh, put as much focus on improving our, our food environment and losing weight, given that 80% of people who actually had uh, the virus and actually went to the hospital with that were either overweight or obese. I mean, that should have been the headline. That should have been the 24-7 coverage, right? And right. I'm not saying that all the stuff is bad. For some people, if you have comorbidities, you're at a high you know, risk group please do it, you know, but yeah. for somebody who like me, who hasn't been sick in nine years, not even with a flu, like, give me a break. You know, I, I literally sweat my butt off every single day working. I see hard. your Instagram. I know it's true. I'm working hard. I'm lifting weights. I'm sprinting. I'm running. I'm eating meat. I mean, I kill myself every day to be healthy and to boost my immune system. You know, so I don't need to be mandated into anything. So, but anyway, let's not go off on this rant. <laughs> I, mean, I don't want to be canceled either. I, I feel like, is that, I can't tell that's one or two for us today, but it's a, we're at least, See, we're pushing it. I promise you. I will say this though about politics. Yeah. I will say this. I'll get into, if I, if I'm going to get into politics, I think the one thing that I can really, I really start, um, like my mind starts exploding a little bit over is some of the legislation now that is so pro vegan because mm -hmm. once again, like yeah. if we think about marketing, you think about propaganda, the vegan diet is what it's healthier, right? Eating greens. How could it not be? It's better for the environment. Right. And then it's also going to, um, impact like the, you know, your ethics. It's, you know, it's like more ethical, right? So it'll all even it make checks... you rich. I mean, what else probably. could it not do? I mean, yeah. any <laughs> makes your dick bigger. I'm sure. Exactly. I'm, I don't know, but it's probably, but like, if you look at those things, those things are obvious <laughs> because they are common knowledge because that's, what's been the rhetoric that's been parroted over and over again. So now you have to go take this very complicated issue dealing with the environment, like all these things like ethics, you know, and also like health, which are all three extremely complicated systems in themselves. And you have to prove them at the same time. Like you're like, you know, standing on stage at like, a, you know, <laughs> doing a, like a mathematical proof because now what's happening is people are starting to like, like in New York, for example, yeah, they do meatless Mondays and they do vegan Fridays. Right. And this is the New York school districts. So in the New York school district, 80% of the kids are getting free or reduced lunch. So they're getting their meals there. 10% of those kids are homeless. This is the one meal they can count on getting every single day. And now we've pulled off 40% of the meat, which has critical vitamins, minerals, and nutrients that are, that are like massively important to developing brains. So now you talk about, you want to talk about like, oh, making sure that people that like people who are marginalized are getting opportunities. Well, now we're pulling out the vital nutrients that are going to keep them from developing properly. Yeah. Now, like now we have an issue, right? Yeah. So now this, now this nutrition issue, which I do believe is my purview has become a political issue yeah. and no one's talking about it. So I think that that's, that's where I want to like take my, and plant my flag in for, in terms of politics, eat, eat more meat in schools. It's uh, yeah. This whole thing happened. I think, who was it? Eric Adams. Um, I believe is the the mayor who he went vegan and although he's been caught uh, eating fish and he admitted that yeah occasionally i'll eat fish but <laughs> the school kids can't have the protein they can only have a vegan diet <laughs> so yeah. i think he passed that law um into in in the and it, it i mean it's i i think it's coming from a good place i think like he, he probably has good intentions because he went from a completely crappy diet to like, imagine eating, you know, McDonald's every day and Snickers bars or whatever chocolate. Again, you're going to feel you know? way better. 
Yeah. And then you go and you, and you have a salad, you definitely are going to get better. Right. At least yeah. initially. And so then you think, Oh, this is great. I, I figured it out. A vegan diet is wonderful. And then you get sucked into the whole cultish movement. And then you start as a politician, you want to do good and you want to, you know, help improve the health of the children. And you're like, let's do that as well. And it's just really heartbreaking to see how ignorance in, in nutrition can have such you know catastrophic effects in in that instance and we haven't even seen the effects yet that's the scary part yeah. is that we're going to look back in 10 20 or 30 years mm -hmm. and be like holy shit how did this whole generation end up you know wanting to be minecraft players be like veganism. <laughs> you know like like we don't even know what's going to happen and yeah. like we're i'm seeing it and we're like stop please just like even like that just nasty stew meat is going to be better than just eating like some amalgamation of seed oils and beans that you're that you're pretending is healthier they're gonna have a lower intelligence levels weaker mm -hmm. bones mm -hmm. vegan and vegetarian children are on average what like i think it's uh 1.25 inches i believe shorter than than other kids who are eating the meat so yeah you can't legally give like put kids on a vegan diet in the uk but we can do it here you can't in the uk nope, it's, it's, oh wow it's, yeah, it falls under like I don't know if it's technically child abuse or not, but it's like you like that is they have to make that on their choice on their own. Pretty high up so. there, yeah, yeah. I mean, children have literally died because their parents have put them on a vegan diet. Um, women have had miscarriages because they were vegan. Um, you know, so one podcast after another, we'll get there. We'll get we'll there. Spread the word. <laughs> we'll get there. Just don't say the V word. Yeah, I know. We well, we did say it, didn't we? So that's my bad. I should have known. I should have thought about that. No, it's fine. I've said it in earlier interviews, like recent interviews, and nothing happens. So okay, I don't know. What can you we just do? blame it on me? If if Mark Zuckerberg calls, just be like, it was that guy Nate. <laughs> I don't know. We're Seemed joking. like kind of an unwashed Nate. person. We'll beg for forgiveness. Yeah. <sighs> anyway, <laughs> so Nate, um, what are you up to these days? Just. Just working out a little bit, eat, eating meats. One thing I've been trying to do is just is like find different different uh, ways of eating more red meat. Mm. So I've been buying a lot of like roasts and doing those. I do like two minutes on each side of the barbecue. Then I turn off the heat and just do indirect heat for like 15, 20 minutes. And that has been fantastic. So I've been big on the kind of like trending more towards carnivore. So I've been doing a lot of red meat and a lot of in-season fruit. It's kind of been my jam recently. Do you um, notice better recovery when you take out the plants? I feel like for me, especially the veggies, um, I, if I have a touch of vegetables because of the amount of um, working out that I do, it's like automatically I get sore the next day. And I know that it can't be because of my intensity of the workouts because I always do that. The only thing that changes is that I had a, a, a little piece of broccoli, you know? Hmm. No, I don't really notice, notice a, like a big difference between like, you know, the weeks where I don't have vegetables and the weeks I'll, I'll, I'll throw some in. Okay. I always feel pretty good. I'm always sleeping pretty good. So like with keto, I didn't like when I did that 30 day experiment, it wasn't like, I was like, oh wow, I felt so shitty before. I always feel really good. I'm, I'm, I really prioritize my recovery and stuff. So right. it's not fair to like, look at that and be like, oh, it's night and day difference. Like if you had taken someone who's eating McDonald's all the time, you throw them on the keto diet, they're going to be like mind yeah. blown. Right. Yeah. When you just eliminate all of those things, but I'm not eating a lot of refined sugars or grains or things like that anyways. So but I have been trying to really ramp up my, um, my red meat. Um, I had Rob Wolf on the podcast. That dude is a savage. He's I so know. awesome. Have you yeah. interviewed him? No, but I have listened to all his podcasts. I mean, so many of them, um, go, go get him on the show. He'll, I was he'll probably come on still show. in Lebanon when I would listen to him. So how, how did you get in contact with him? Go to his website. And there's like a way you can just book, book it. I can, I'll also, I can send you an email and show yeah. you, show you where to go to do that. Yeah. But yeah. he was so cool. And they, we were talking about this book, Sacred Cow, and talking about just like how when they were doing, when they were filming this book and they took, or they're filming the, the, the documentary and writing this book, they took all this information about red meat. Okay. This is the craziest thing. And they were like, because Rob Wolf, big paleo guy, and he, had, he was kind of at the forefront of the grass fed movement. So he was always like grass fed, grass fed, grass fed. So he took all the information from these grass fed, like locally sourced ranchers and all these from these more like conventionally raised cows. And he's like, all right, let's compare the data. So him and his team compared the data and they're like, uh, looks about the same. And he's like, that's not good. 
we've been talking about grass-fed beef for 10 years. So he sent it to an independent research lab and was like, hey, just look at these two pieces of data. Tell me what you think is the same. And so basically, besides the omega-3 fatty acids, there wasn't much. Yeah. Um, there's no difference between those. And he said, if you want to get the omega-3s that like that you would need to like make up the difference, you'd have to eat five pounds of cow, or you could go have six, six ounces of salmon. He's like, you don't eat, eat cow for omega-3s. But he went on to kind of describe the process that ruminants, the cows with four stomachs, are so amazing at taking plants or grains or like he was even talking about how people were using like distillery mash like so like the the excess from making bourbon like this like this this mash of the grains feeding it to cows and they're so efficient at converting that into high quality protein that their internal digestive system does so much of the work for us it is this perfect like it's this perfect plant-based protein processing plant. That is a cool sentence. I got to write that on that, put on a t-shirt. <laughs> but he's like, there's no difference. So he's like, go eat, go eat whatever, whatever type you want. Cause he's like, and he's like, by the way, most people, if they have cows, they're going to let them graze as much as possible anyways. Cause that's free. That's free, free food. True. So I just have so much respect for someone who could look at all of what they've said for the last 10 years and goes, uh, I wasn't quite right about that. Yeah. So all the people that have been talking about sacred cow, there's been no vegan takedowns of this documentary at all. He's just because his his science is unfuckwithable. He's just got it together. The only people who've been mad about it are these ranchers who are like, no, but grass fed is better. And he's like, I thought so too, but that's not what it says here. Yeah. So thought that was so interesting. He's such a cool dude too. He is I'm best friends with him. Yeah. I I make my students watch the documentary, Sacred Cow, every semester. Um, and I, I've listened to that, to that bit that you're referring to when he was on the Joe Rogan podcast with Diana Rogers, and they were talking about all this stuff. And I think, I think it's, it's crazy to me to have somebody who never changes, especially in science and like what we're doing every day, we're learning something new every day. I mean, from a conversation, from a scientific article, from a book, from a documentary, from there's so many sources of information, right? that to not change and evolve based on new information is like so dumb, you know, and people want to see you evolve. They don't, you know, they, they, they want you to keep up, you know? Yeah. So. Isn't there, there's a quote that says something of the extent of like the guy who has those same opinions at 60 as he did at 30 has wasted his last 30 years or something. Yeah. It's like, what have you been doing? <laughs> Right. Yeah. Living like, in a bubble. Yeah. Yeah. Because there's so much out there and there's, and like the more you learn, the more nuance that you can, you can bring to things too. Exactly. Uh, here's another quote I'd love to butcher for you. If you, if you don't, if you don't mind. Please do. But it's something at the extent of like, when I was young, I, a tree was just a tree. And then as I grew up, I noticed there was like, there was all these components to it. There's the bark and the leaves and this and all these, all these things. And then as I grew older, I realized that a tree is just a tree. So basically like kind of chronicling your journey. And I think a lot of us are in this with fitness, you know, like when you're looking at someone, you're like, oh man, that guy's fit, right? So athletic. That's awesome. And then all of a sudden you're like, well, how many sets and reps is he doing? Is he doing, is he doing a dynamic method? Is he doing any periodization? Well, how is he eating? What does the peri and post recovery, like workout recovery look like to take any supplements? And then you start like spinning yourself up. And then after a while, you're just like, yeah, just exercise more. Just move that's a little harder. Funny. Just do a little better technique. That's you know? that's exactly probably what I went through, you know, because you start off and then I, I started doing my nutrition thing, right? Um, and learning all of the counting calories, all that stuff, um, learning about different diets, blah, blah, blah. And then and then the science is like, you know, being so deep into the scientific articles that are coming out. And then eventually you realize it's like all of this most of it was garbage. And then it's like, now it's just eat meat, lift and repeat. And that's what I always say. Yeah. You know, eat meat, eat meat, lift weights, eat meat, lift. If you repeat. can't fish, fix it with a ribeye and some squats. You're probably going to die. So Ooh. Ouch. <laughs> you said it. I could say it cause I'm on your show. Yes. I had, a, exactly. I had to mind my own. I had to button up last time when we talked you, on my you, show. You've got it. Yeah. <laughs> you've got the guest immunity. That's right. I love guest immunity. <laughs> you like that? So, um, all right. Well, it's been an hour already. It, 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 it? went so fast. So <laughs> thank you so much, Nate. Where can people find you? 
you can come uh, check out the, the podcast at, at uh, low carb hustle. It's on all the podcasting places, but honestly, if you want to just, if you want to like hang out, go on Instagram at low carb hustle. I post just like some good content, but mostly dumb shit. And I just want to have a really good time. That's my, like, that's my guilty pleasure platform. So I'm always on there trying Pretty to entertaining. make myself laugh if nothing else. So I'm <laughs> having fun. I don't know if anyone else is or not, but I have a good time. <laughs> Awesome. I'm going to make sure I link all of those platforms uh, and links in the description box below of this video. Thank you again, May. Do you want to end with any specific message or is there anything we forgot to talk about? Yeah, I uh, there's something I want to do some more self-promotion. No, I think if I, if I could say like boil all this stuff down into like one thing, like, you know, obviously there's a lot of nuance around nutrition and eating correctly. But the, at the end of the day, you can't lose at this stuff. You can't fail at getting in shape, and getting fit. The only way that you can actually fail is if you quit trying. So whether you're hitting Zumba classes and eating a green power smoothie in the morning or eating ribeyes and squatting really heavy, like as long as you keep taking a step forward every single day and an attempt to get 1% better, just a little bit better, you are eventually going to win and you are not it's not possible to stop you. So you can't lose if you don't quit. No matter what, just keep showing up and doing the work. Wow. I love it. I I am like so much into the quotes and inspiration on that kind of stuff. Um, and it is so true. And even if you feel like sometimes you're taking 10 steps back, that one step forward back again will set everything back in motion. You build momentum again. And now even though you might feel, wow, I'm now like further along from where I was, it doesn't matter because now you're so much smarter than yesterday. And and you, you just got to remember that. And it's, yeah, I, I love it. What a perfect way to end this interview. You can only fail if you stop trying. Thank you so much, Nate. It's been a pleasure. Thank you all for joining us and sticking with us till the end. I hope you enjoyed this content. If you did, make sure you give this video a thumbs up, subscribe. And hit that little notification bell icon so YouTube alerts you every time I post a new video. Thank you all for watching and I will see you in the next one.